What's good, family? It's your man, Daryl II. I hope you're doing well. Before we go forward, let's go before the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this word. I thank you for giving me the clarity and the heart to share it and just the words to say. It is your spirit working through me, through me who gives me the ability to not only communicate and articulate your word, but to share what you want to be said. So as I come before the people, I pray that it would be your spirit that governs the conversation and that you would lead me in the direction you desire for me to go. I thank you that I am an instrument of your service. And I thank you, God, for the preparations of your word and that you would get the glory in this message. Heavenly Father, I pray more souls would be brought to your kingdom <clears throat> through your son, Jesus Christ. And I pray that seeds would be planted in the hearts of the hearers and uh, watchers of this word. Father, get the glory increase as I step to the side to hide under your shadow in the mighty name of Jesus. And any doors open in my life, not of you, I close them in the name of Jesus and repent of any sins. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, y'all, my name is Daryl the Second. Um, you can find me on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. For those of you, sometimes this, on, this is a reel and it cuts off at like a minute 30. So to watch the full video, you could always click in the comments of, of this shared on Facebook or go to those platforms that I just shared, Daryl Alder II. Um, I wanted to share a story because I was having a conversation with a friend the other day and it was just interesting. We were talking about how the Lord, um, this day and age, he still brings judgment. He brings grace, but there are times where he brings judgment too, because we reap what we sow. And that's why repentance is so important. It's not so that you live in fear because a lot of times I think people are under the impression that God is just waiting to catch them and bring doom and gloom to their life. And that's not true. But he does not like sin, which is why he sent Jesus to be the sacrifice for humanity. If we receive him as our Lord and Savior, then we can be exempted from eternal judgment. But receiving Jesus as our Lord and Savior is us committing ourselves to him and being adopted in the family of God through faith in the Son, Jesus Christ. <clears throat> but one of the things we were speaking of in modern day age, which even parallels to the word of God, is how God will use his children to be a message of grace through the lives and example of their lives of how they live for the Lord. Sometimes in the message of the gospel through their words or just living out a life of holiness unto the Lord, people get an opportunity to see a representation of Jesus, a representation of a follower of Jesus and Jesus working through the followers of him. And so there are seasons where people can see the children of God and the spirit of God at work through the children of God and recognize the difference between this person they're looking at versus someone else uh, who may not know the Lord. And these are opportunities for God to demonstrate to these people who may not know him that he loves them, and that he desires for them to be saved and be a Christian, just like the person they're watching. And so there's no way anyone can claim ignorance of not knowing of an opportunity to know the Lord because God sends people who are his, his children in different scenarios and different situations. And sometimes we'll even be witnesses to people who are doing very wicked things. And there are countless stories of this. And so I want to review a few stories. Um, one story I want to bring up is the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. And I'll read some, but I'm going to go ahead and just tell you. Um, this is found in the book of Genesis. And the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, there was a lot of wickedness that had taken place in that city and judgment was on its way. And Lot, who happened to be the nephew of Abraham, was in the city. And these men came to him. They happened to be angels, and they came to his home. Actually, he encountered these men. He invited them in their home. And then the men of the city came to the, te to the, to the door of Lot, wanting to see these two men so that they could sleep with them. They wanted to have sex with these two men. And Lot was saying, this is a wicked act. You can do no such thing. I think he even offered his daughters. Um, as a result... The two men had made it clear to Lot that they had come to judge the city because the wickedness of the city had gone before the father. And so Lot wanted to warn his family about the judgment. But when he attempted to do so, his family didn't hear him. And so the the time was running out and the angels were letting him know there's a set time for what we are about to do. You must leave. And when they were taking too much time, the angels grabbed them and forcibly got them out of the city. Lot, his wife and his two daughters. And he, he said, Lot said, we can't make it to a safe passage to avoid the destruction of the city. Can you give us a little more time? So the angels gave him time. And they said, but get to the mountains. But whatever you do, do not look back. And as they were running and I think judgment began to occur, Lot's wife looked back and she immediately died. She turned into a pillar of salt. Now, what I want to emphasize is these analogies that can't, or I'm sorry, these 
these little symbolisms or messages that came from this story. That's a literal story, but let me let you know how that translates to modern day era. So you hear, you see Lot, the New Testament refers to him as righteous Lot, how his, his soul was burdened by the sin of the city. He was in a way a witness for the people there. And he spread the message of judgment, trying to give people salvation, his family to pull him out. They didn't heed him. And as a result, he narrowly escaped while everyone else suffered. There was a set season for him in that city, city and there was a set season for, I'm sorry, a new season for him to depart the city. This day and age, God will use children of God. God will use his children and place them in job sites in different areas and allow them to be in certain people's lives for a season. And then God will say, it is time for you to move because I'm going to bring a lesson of accountability or a judgment to this person's life. And the thing that, that's good about the Lord, even though we reap what we sow, he does offer mercy. But if you continuously reject that mercy, you may find that time is up one day. So that's why you want to be careful with that. But um, the Bible says in the book of Romans, God's goodness is to lead men to repentance. So his love is enraptured in his judgment, but he still spanks you. But there are some people who don't want anything to do with the Lord. And they want to alienate themselves from the Lord entirely and live a life apart from God and, and, and live in their wickedness, live in their sin. And as a result, they are headed to destruction. They are headed to a place called hell. And God doesn't want that, but he gives us the free will. And so sometimes as children of God, God will pull you from a place after having used you as a witness, as a message, as a walking letter, like epistle, not letter like ABC, but letter like which you used to write in mail in the mailbox so people can read your life and realize that you were of him. He'll remove you so that they are in a state where they have to come to realization of a, a fork in the road. Do I follow Jesus or do I not? They have to have that revelatory moment. And sometimes we don't know what happens, but we just know the Lord, the judgment of the Lord will sometimes come upon people's lives for the choices they've made. Again, he loves you, but he gives you what we reap, what we sow. The Bible says the wages of sin is death and the gift of God is eternal life. A wage is something you earn, just like at a job. You earn your money because you're working to earn it. Death is something we earn. Um, it's just the wages when we have sin. Uh, the wages of sin is death. So the payout is death from our sin. So that's the wage. And so in any way, and so God offers a gift, which is eternal life, which is through Jesus Christ. And so I'm saying this to say that there are instances where God is saying, I need to remove you because judgment is coming. And when you try to ignore the warnings or not move as God sees fit, what can happen? A couple of things. One, God can forcibly make you move. Just like I told you in that story. Another thing, you may be there and if judgment should come, you may experience some of that because you're in the wrong place at the wrong time. I, I just think that's so powerful because um, it's kind of like trying to hold on to something that God said let go of. Just like we saw with Lot's wife. She held on and she lost her life. And Jesus said, here's another example. He said, if you lose your life for my sake, you will find it. But if you find your life, he will, <laughs> and I'm trying to quote King James. Let me say that in a different way. He who tries to hold on to his life will lose it. But he who loses his life for my sake shall find it. That's what he said. And when he was talking, he was saying, trying to hold on to this world, it can't, you can't because the world's passing away. So if you try to hold on to this life, you're going to lose it. But if you're willing to lose this life for him, you'll find true eternal life. And that is the powerful comparison that we're speaking of. And in the story I shared, you saw that Lot's wife wanted to hold on to the past that they were leaving and not walk in the future. And she lost her life. And so I'm saying to you, when God removes you from a scenario or he warns you to leave, take heed and leave. You've done what you were supposed to do in that season. It's time to move. Um, the Bible says in the book of Corinthians, one plants, one waters, but it is God that causes the increase. God may have used you in the lives of people for a season, and that's okay. But the Lord is saying, it's time to move. You must go. You can't do anything more. You've done what you're supposed to do. At this point, you're overstaying your season. And it's kind of like food that's left out or it's overstayed its expiration date. It becomes bad. If you stay there, you become counterproductive and purposeless because you are no longer impactful. And what can happen is instead of inclining and improving and progressing in your walk, you start to decline and regress because you are in disobedience. And so you're in a state of sin. 
And so now you're going to be reprimanded because you're disobeying the Lord or you're going to be miserable not having joy in your life because you're not cooperating with the Holy Spirit. The Bible says now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we can ask or think according to the power that works in us. The power that works in it, in you, you have to be in accordance with, in agreement with, to truly see the impact of the power in your life. Otherwise, you're kind of like a walking contradiction, or you're like, uh, what's the word I'm looking at? You're not operating at your fullest potential. The Bible says that in the last days, there will be those who have a form of godliness, but they're denying the power inside that could truly make them godly. So you have an outward expression of godliness, but it's not real. So you're being a hypocrite. You're kind of hollow. Another scripture, Jesus says these, uh, well, he, I think Jesus quoted it, but Isaiah said it because God gave it to him. He said, um, these people's worship is a farce. They honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And it's easy for us to say, Lord, I honor you. I reverence you. I lift your name on high with our words. But your heart is an indication of where you truly reside in your decisions. Jesus said, or <laughs> Solomon said in the book of Proverbs, guard your heart above all else. For it determines the courses in life that you will take. That's another subject matter, but I'll just say, watching what you watch, be careful what you listen to. Be careful who you and who you surround yourself with. And so sometimes you'll be in scenarios with people who may not know the Lord and God has put you there to help them. But there may be times God says move and when you don't move, what ends up happening is they're not being drawn closer to the Lord, but you're being drawn away from the Lord because you are in sin. And it doesn't mean you can't be, you can't repent and you know, get back on track. But it does mean if you're in an atmosphere longer than you should have been, your effectiveness is limited because you've overstayed your season. And what can happen is you start to succumb to sinful areas in your own life because you're not walking in obedience. Does that make sense? I'm gonna give you another story. Daniel chapter six, um, the story of Daniel in the lion's den. Actually, no, Daniel chapter three, excuse me. The story of uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now, I'm not going to go in full detail, but I'll say this. The king, Nebuchadnezzar, he wanted everyone to worship this idol. And those three Hebrew boys, Hebrew boys wouldn't do it. So he tried to kill them. And when he saw God save them, that was God witnessing through their lives about how powerful he was. Now, Nebuchadnezzar got humbled greatly later on, as you keep reading the, um, the book of Daniel. But... After he was humbled, he gave his life to the Lord because he is writing the story of how God humbled him and took his sanity away and how afterwards he gives reverence to God. So look at the steps that led to him being saved, his salvation. He saw God move in the lives of these believers, but it took him being broken in his pride for him to come to himself. And so sometimes that's what it takes. So don't think that you're saving people by bringing them to the Lord. No, 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 no. You are doing the right thing by bringing them to the Lord, but it is God who saves people, not you. He who wins souls is wise. So we are tools in the hand of Jesus, but we are not Jesus. So when God tells you to move or he tells you to do something, you must do it. First Samuel 15, 22, obedience is better than sacrifice. You can do all these great sacrifices, but, and even for the Lord, but are you being obedient? Because that's what he wants. Because when you're being obedient, you're cooperating with him and his will for your life, and you are being a living sacrifice. That's what he wants. Now, I said I was going to read. This is going to cut out in a minute because on Instagram, they only give me 15 minutes. So for the full video, you got to go to YouTube. But I will say this. Anybody watching, if you don't have a relationship with the Father, you cannot have one unless you have one with his son, Jesus Christ. This comes from a confession of faith and a belief in your heart that Jesus is Lord, that he died on the cross, and that God the Father raised him back from the dead. And if you truly believe that, then you will be born again, his spirit in your heart. John 3, 16 says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son and that whoever believes in him will not perish, but will have everlasting life. So if you'd like this, simply repeat after me, Lord Jesus, I believe you died on the cross. I believe God the Father raised you back from the dead. I ask you to come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior. If you did that, you're born again. The next step is to get baptized in water so that you can be born of the water and of the spirit. Get in a Bible-based church. That's the next step, excuse me, then water. And watch God transform your life. And I'm going to start reading this, but I'm going to cite the scriptures on this video so you can go look them up for yourself and read the stories. All right, check this out. Genesis 19. Now the two angels came to Sodom in the evening and Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. 
When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. And he said, Hear now, my lords, please turn into your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet. Then you may rise early and go on your way. And they said, No, but we will spend the night in the open square. But he insisted strongly, so they turned into him and entered his house. Then he made them a feast and baked unleavened bread, and they ate. Now before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both old and young, all the people from every quarter surrounded the house. And they called to Lot and said to him, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may know them carnally. They want to sleep with them. So Lot went out to them through the doorway, shut the door behind him and said, Please, my brethren, do not do so wickedly. See now, I have two daughters who have not known a man. Please let me bring them out to you, and you may do to them as you wish. That's not cool. And only do nothing to these men, since this is reason they have come under the shadow of my roof. And they said, Stand back. Then they said, This one came in to, him to stay here, and he keeps acting as a judge. Now we will deal worse with you than with them. So they pressed hard against the man Lot and came near to break the door. But the men, these angels, reached out their hands and pulled Lot into the house with them and shut the door. And they struck the men who were at the doorway of the house with blindness, both small and great, so that they became weary trying to find the door. Then the men said to Lot, Have you anyone else here, son-in-law, your sons, your daughters, and whomever you have in this city? Take them out of this place, for we will destroy this place, because the outcry against them has gone has grown great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. So Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-laws who had married his daughters and said, get up and get out of this place for the Lord will destroy this city. But to his son-in-laws, he seemed to be joking. When the morning dawned, the angels hurried Lot, urged Lot to hurry saying, arise, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, lest you be consumed in the punishment of the city. That, that's powerful, you gotta get out. And while he lingered, the men took hold of his hand, his wife's hands, and the hands of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful to him, and they brought him out and set him outside the city. So it came to pass, when they had brought them outside, that he had said, Escape for your life. Do not look behind you, nor stay anywhere in the plain. Escape to the mountains, lest you be destroyed. Then Lot said to them, Please know, my lords, indeed now your servant has found favor in your sight, and you have increased your mercy, which you have shown me, by saving my life. But I cannot escape to the mountains lest some evil overtake me and I die. See now, this city is near enough to flee to and it is a little one. Please let me escape there. Is it not a little one and my soul shall live? And he said to him, See, I have favored you concerning this thing also in that I will not overthrow this city for which you have spoken. Hurry, <coughs> escape there, for I cannot do anything until you arrive there. Therefore, the name of the city was called Zoar. The sun had risen upon the earth when Lot entered Zoar. Then the Lord rained brimstone and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of, heaven, out of the heavens. So he overthrew those cities, all the plain, all the inhabitants of the city, and what grew on the ground. But his wife looked back behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. And Abraham went early in the morning to the place where he had stood before the Lord. Then he looked towards Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the plain. And he saw, and behold, the smoke of the land, which went up like the smoke of a furnace. And it came to pass, when God destroyed the cities of the plain, that God remembered Abraham and Lot, I'm sorry, remembered Abraham, and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow, when he overthrew the cities in which Lot had dwelt. Now, what's powerful about that, I didn't read this to you. Abraham had talked to God about sparing the city prior to this moment, if there were a certain number, number of individuals who were righteous, were to be found in the city. Apparently, the only righteous ones was Lot. It's, 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 well, I'd say his wife, but she did. His daughters, well, they do some stuff in a minute. I guess they're righteous. I, right, but the Bible refers to uh, Lot as being righteous. That brings me to my next point. You never know who's praying for you. Somebody praying for you could you very well save your life. I mean, Lot was in that city and tormented, but he chose to be there. Sometimes we make compromises and we find ourselves tormented over our choices and i don't mean to contradict myself earlier because god because god gave lot permission to stay in that city and the bible refers to him as righteous lot but you can learn a lot from this lesson god can plant you somewhere or we can be in a situation and god's mercy work through us but then god can pluck us up 
You take from this what God is telling you. My point in all this is God is moving and he can help your life just by the prayer of someone else, but he can also remove you when judgment comes. Because often before God brings judgment, he sends a word of warning so that people are not ignorant to what is coming and they have an opportunity to repent. Anyway, I hope this word encouraged you. I hope it blessed you. I've already done the repentance prayer. And the reason why that's important, what I said earlier, is because if you don't know Jesus, when you're dying, you're going to go to hell. When you die, you go to hell. He doesn't want that. That's why he said, I have said, he sent his son to die on the cross for your sins. And Jesus said, I have come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. He wants you to have an abundant life on this earth and the life to come. I pray this word blessed you, encouraged you. I believe it will. It, because God was breathed on it. Uh, he will get the glory. You be blessed and encouraged. I got one more metaphor. I keep doing this. Read the book of Noah. I'm going to tag it. He built the boat. People mocked him. But when the rain came, he was saved. Everybody else wasn't. You better follow God's timetable. Because when judgment comes, what will you do? Peace.